I'm telling you, it makes me feel like it's Wayne's World. <laughs> There's a few of you who get that still. It's just, I appreciate it. One of my first dates was going to Wayne's World. Isn't that crazy? That's how old I am, right? I was, it, was, it was one of those things where like, I was with this girl, literally a girl, and her mom was there. <laughs> so like, <laughs> sat between us. You know, it was pretty awesome. Anyway, you don't need to hear that. Okay, so that's our likelihood function. We, we used one observation, so we had this one term in our function. And we didn't know mu, so we put it in. We put in all values of mu, and we found out the most likely value happened to be 112. And lo and behold, that's our sample mean for one observation. Pretty cool. And with the normal distribution, actually with most distributions, what you'll find is the mean of the distribution will be your sample mean as an MLE. Go figure. So what we have, though, is we have a sample of people. Right? We don't have one person, we have a whole sample of them. And each one of them, we're assuming, has a normal distribution. In fact, we go a step further and say each, one's nor each person's normal distribution has the same mean and stand standard deviation. Now, in, in a regression analysis, we know the mean is conditional on some other variables. It's like a conditional mean. Not everybody's going to have the same mean because not everybody's going to have the same value of x and z and whatever else. So what happens to go from one observation to the sample is we take each one of those likelihood functions. Now we use the this L to denote the function that we saw on the previous page. And for each person, we multiply them together. Why we're multiplying them together is the same reason why you'd say, if I flipped a coin and I got heads, and I flipped the coin again and I got heads, what's the probability I would flip heads twice with those coins? 0.5 times 0.5, right? They're independent, independent coin flips. If we believe our sample to have be independent people, we take each one of their distributions and multiply them together. That gives us a sample likelihood function. Now you might be saying, but wait a minute. What if my people aren't independent? What if this first set of them come from classroom A and this next set comes from classroom B? Aha! That's where we have to change the model out. We have to get into a multi-level model. We have to change the distribution that goes with it. But the same process still holds whatever the highest level of the sampling unit might be is what you put in for the distribution. For us today, these are all just univariate distributions, just one x. But that, that we could still put in a distribution that has more than one x. Like if we had five observations from each person, this first person's distribution would have five components, five x's, a multivariate distribution. So likelihood function, the process of building it from one observation to a sample involves multiplying each of those together, and I did this for us, or the product of the PDFs. That's it right there in the middle. And this is where things get real terrible and ugly. If you use a little bit, of, remember your rules of exponents in algebra? How uh, I many of you rolled? I'm getting laughs. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh huh. <laughs> right. Uh, we can use rules of exponents to. Believe it or not, I'm going to say the word, simplify this equation. No, that's not true. That's another thing statisticians do. Clearly, this is simply, uh, what we can do is just take this product term and work it through. So that is our sample log likelihood function. If we believe all of our data follows a normal distribution, right? So this last term here, sample likelihood function, excuse me, we observed all the x's. Right, so we have all that. This function gives us the likelihood of any mu and any sigma. Right? So if we were to think about it, and actually by the end of class we'll do this, we'll start off by, by saying we assume sigma. We're just going to try, try different mu's. But by the end of class we'll do them both. It's like having a, a surface in two dimensions to find the peak of. Right? Try out all the mu's while you're trying out all the sigma's. And so you'll have this function that shows up in two dim or three dimensions, really. How are we doing? All right. So there's our likelihood function. We don't know mu and sigma. Our goal is to figure out mu and sigma that give us the most, the, the peak, the highest likelihood. By the way, for those of you who've taken calculus, the word ma maximum shows up in calculus a lot. There's usually a derivative involved. We could do that. And actually, for a lot of the statistics that, we'll view, that we've used up to this point, they have done that, and they're already done. But not everyone can use that. So 
we'll get there in just a second. You'll see that in just a bit. We're doing more of the brute force because calculus isn't a requirement for this class. Um, so there's our likelihood function. Right. So if we know that the variance is 5.29, we now can go and try out values of mu again. Right? The difference between this plot and the plot I showed you a few slides ago is that a few slides ago we had one observation. Here we're using our whole sample, which is actually five observations. But still a fairly small number just to see how it works. So this is the likelihood function. The maximum of it happened to be at a very small number, 1.67, uh, and I don't even know how to pronounce that. That has moved the decimal six places to the left, right? It's really tiny. But that's the peak, and it happened to be at 114.4. And you can't see it, but if you were to go back to the first slide, first slide where we talk about data, you'll see that the mean of our sample was 114.4. So we actually found the sample mean. Turns out, again, the sample mean is an MLE for a lot of things that we do, which is a convenient way of looking at it. Questions on this? Who's sold? Anybody? Yeah, that's good. I like that. Carolina. <laughs> All right, Carolina is sold. Anybody, do I need to keep convinced? How many, how many anybody else? All right, I'm going to keep working. Try to do this. Now, the likelihood function sounds nice and all well and good, but often what we see in program output is not the likelihood function, it's the log likelihood function. So that ugly function that we had before, what we're going to do is make it uglier. We're going to take the natural log of it and work with that instead. We do that in part because uh, the logs are somewhat numbers that are farther away from zero, generally speaking. So in our computer, uh, we have a little bit more numeric stability to them. It's also a little bit easier to work with if you are trying to do the analytic side of this, the calculus side of it. It's a little bit easier to work with this function. The, the log here, the word log, I'm actually get, we're, we're referring to the natural log, right? So oftentimes we'll just see log itself, but no, this is the natural log or the inverse of Euler's or the E function, right? the natural number. Anyway, I got a bit, I, math is not Math is not my thing, I'm sorry. I have to say this with this on the board. Mm -hmm. My first math class in college, remedial math, by the way. I nearly dropped out of high school and it was because of math. I failed a number of them. The professor put this symbol up on the board and I panicked, right? So that's the person when I say math is not my thing, that's how I'm coming out. Yet I can now tell you all of this, right? So this is where I say, if math isn't your thing either, I know you can do this because I can do this, right? I did this. I did this before. You may not want to do it, and you may not have to do it, and that's fine. It's a different thing, but you can do it. So. Anyway, log. We took the log of all those functions. Would be like when we, the log is nice because it takes a product. The log of a product of things becomes the sum of the log of those things. So this log of the product becomes the sum of the logs. What it works out to be is this ugly function down here. But the nice thing about the log likelihood is that the maximum, right, where the maximum happens is at the same point, right? So the log, the likelihood function had a value that was very close to zero, like zero, six, five zeros and one, six, seven, right? This, the maximum of the log likelihood happens at negative 13.3, <coughs> which is actually the log of that other number, right? So negative 13.3, not really close to zero. It's actually much more negative than zero but it's at least numbers that we don't have to put the decimal way out in the front. Uh, but you'll note that the value that maximizes is again 114.4, it's the same value. So the log likelihood is what we often work with. And the log likelihood has some really magical properties. Right? I'm, I'm, you're not done selling maximum likelihood, right? If you thought those three things I showed you before were awesome, I'm gonna add one more, act now. The log likelihood, if we were to go and try two, two models, maybe we had this model here. This is a simple model, but we did it. We, um, we plugged in the variance of 5.29. Let's imagine you say, Templin, where did you get that variance? Like, I know Megan would say this, right? Megan, what, what variance would you pick here? Megan's variance, the Megan SMR. No, you're not going to click. Five, right? <laughs> 
So if Megan chooses 5 and I choose 5.29, which one would you prefer? Okay. How would you tell? What would you do? Could you tell that one was better or worse than the other? How would you do that? Our log likelihood will help inform us on that. Although that example is not as good as an on the fly example, that probably is going to break down eventually. But that's the concept. If you have two models for data, one way that you can help compare them is that log likelihood, although it gets twisted. It is a function of the log likelihood that does it. So, so but let's not do that. Let's not, let's not let Megan and I argue about variance. I mean, I, I'm your co-advisor. There's plenty of things we'll argue about now. Especially about variance. <laughs> Especially about variance. Um, I'm a terrible person. But... Uh, and they're all they're all nodding their head. They yeah. This is my program students over here. This is why I know I have the report with them. They've been in grad school a while. So if, if you you'll have that report too. It's okay. You'll know I'm a terrible person too. Um, <laughs> my gosh. Uh, the not, the variance itself was uh, we didn't observe that. It's not likely to in practice. Nobody walk, walks around with a variance of oh that's five point two nine. I know what that is, right? So you need to figure out all of the parameters of your estimate. And sim th that likelihood function, again, we could do it in two dimensions. That's what I was mentioning about. We know x, but we don't know mu and we don't know sigma squared. <coughs> okay, instead of just searching over x now, we'll simultaneously search over sigma squared. Like for every value of x, we can try a range of sigma squareds. All right? And that's what you see here. This is mu, or the mean. This is sigma squared with variance. And for every combination, the height of this colorful shape right here is the log likelihood function itself. Right? So I tried out a bunch of means. And for each mean, I tried out a bunch of variances. And here, uh, how many of you like know, con you know the term <coughs> contour map, contour plot? Oftentimes, if you're hiking, there's a, like a, a plot that shows you equal elevation on a mountain. That's what this sort of is right here. This plot right here shows lines of equal height on the likelihood function. Right? So here is a bunch of means. Here's a bunch of variances. And this, the line represents values of the mean and variance that give you the same likelihood. Right? So there's a peak to all of it here. This is an interesting function for several reasons. Number one. We can figure out the peak. It doesn't look like there's one. It's very flat. It's kind of ridged. And the reason for that is we have five observations. Right? To get a variance, the minimum number we have to have is two. Right? So we're like three above the minimum. There's not a lot of information about our variance. And actually, what we're going to find out in later classes, the curve, the curvature of this function right here, right here for the mean direction, is really curved. The variance direction is very flat. That's going to help us talk about how certain we are of our estimate. So this function has a peak. It's hard to tell. It's right in the middle of this. Its peaks at negative 10.7 for the log likelihood. Again, that number by itself, eh. But when you compare it with other, other values, it may mean something. The estimates that brought about the peak was a, a mean of 114.4 right here and a variance of 4.24, which is right here in the center. Right, so we searched over both directions. Now, if you go back to the slide at the beginning, you're going to say, wait a minute. The variance we've been using this whole time was 5.29. Why is it 4.24? Ah, that's because in MLE terms, your, most, your MLE for the variance is like taking that variance formula and dividing by n. Whereas 5.29 was that formula divided by n minus 1. And with five observations, there's a big difference between the two. If we had 500 observations, it'd be very small, very small difference between the two. Right. So this, for a five observation sample, this MLE is like saying it's not really close to infinity, because there's a big difference between what the value, it's biased. Right? How are we doing? I'm introducing several concepts here. Number one, we can search over two dimensions. Number two, uh, we found these two values that gave us the maximum. 
But one of our dimensions is relatively flat, and one's very peaked. But, right? the, the, the curvature of the likelihood itself tells us how certain we are. We're more certain that the mean is 114.4. We're less certain that the variance is 4.24. And the last concept we talk about is in MLE, when you're using a normal distribution, the variance comes out as being divided by n, not n minus 1, or in regression terms, n minus the number of parameters estimated. That is the reason why I have to teach you path analysis, which uses ML, or divide by n, and then go and teach you the same thing, but in mixed model software, which uses a different version of ML, residual maximum likelihood, that gives you an unbiased <coughs> estimate of this variance. That's coming up later on. So this is just foreshadowing as we go on down the road. How are we doing? What's it mean to you? Put it this way. If you're using path analysis software, you may have bias in your variance estimates, which bias a whole lot of other things. If you're using mixed model software, you may not have the bias, but you can't do as many fun things that you can in the path model. So now you have to choose. We theoretically could put the two together, but we've yet to do so in an easy to use manner. So that is why this class exists. It's multivariate. Each of those methods I'm talking about are multivariate methods, but they rely on maximum likelihood or versions of it, residual maximum likelihood. Okay, questions? So you can take my R syntax, you can do that grid search. We call this a grid search. I'm literally trying out incremental values of mu and sigma squared. It's a very naive way of trying to find your parameters. Naive in that, uh, maybe not naive, brute force, right? This is something that you would do, it would be here forever if you had a real complicated model. Right? I sort of knew where to start, so I sort of guessed around there to give you a shape. Right? Realistically, we may not do that. What we may do is use some calculus. I'm just going to briefly talk about calculus here. Right. One of the, the, uh, the issue that we have here is uh, to find a maximum, it's like saying if we were to find a line that's tangent to our curve, this is our MLE, our maximum, our maximum, this is our likelihood function, our log likelihood function. A line that's tangent to it is a line that touches at a very infinitesimally small point by a few, the slope of it. If we could find a line with a slope of zero, that would indicate we're either at a maximum or a minimum of this function. And that's, and that's calculus. The slope of that line, that tangent line, is from the first derivative itself in calculus. So for us, we can use that to our advantage. And here is a graphic. We can figure out, if we could figure out where the slope becomes flat, we could figure out whether we're at a maximum or a minimum. With some more calculus, we could tell actually if it's maximum or minimum and so forth. Lucky for you, all the models we use in this class are uh, concave, right? upside down U, meaning they only have min maximums. The minimums aren't there. So we don't have to worry about maximum versus minimum when we find that. But in using that, if we were to take our log likelihood and perhaps take the first derivative with respect to the mean, we could go and get a new function out of it. If we set, this is this function, this is the slope of the line that's tangent. That is, that is this line right here. This is the mean likelihood function with respect to mu, and that's the line that's tangent. The slope of that line is given by this thing. So if we set that equal to zero and solve for mu, we get our MLE. So how does that work? Our, if we do all that, or we find our MLE is 1 over n times the sum of x, the sum of x over n, which is pretty cool, I think. Right? We did the brute force method, and then calculus comes in and says, oh, look, we can just do this in a couple lines and whatever else. And you know those people who know calculus, right? I'm going to point, those of you who know calculus, oh yeah, how nice, right? We can do the same thing for the variance. It's a little bit more complicated, but you'll see the variance function that we find for the MLE has the sum of x minus its mean squared over n, not over n minus 1. And that's where our bias comes in for this MLE. 
So you're saying, wait a minute, one of the properties of maximum likelihood were that asymptotically it was consistent, it become its true value, right? Well, that because that asymptotic means n goes to infinity, so this n and n minus 1 are indistinguishable in the limit. That's where that comes from. So, calculus, if we have a function like that, we can use calculus. We call the, we call, if we could come up with one equation to give us a maximum likelihood estimate, we call that a closed form. Right? There's one solution. We know what it happens to be. Uh, if we can't, and a lot of the stuff that we're going to do in this class, when we get to multivariate models, we can't, um, we have to search. We'll talk about that in just a slide. One more thing we can do, though, is we can take... If we figure out, if we wanted to figure out the standard error of our estimates, right, or the variance of it, if we took the second derivative of that likelihood function, we would end up with the observed information matrix. And uh, if we take the inverse of that times negative one, we get the variance. Take the square root of this thing, we get the standard error. Now remember the standard error of the mean? The, People in basic stat, you have this thing where you'd say, oh wait, I have a mean, and if I did this sample over and over again, the same sample size, and I jotted down all the means, they'd form a normal distribution, that was a central limit theorem. The standard deviation thing of that, that that thing was supposed to be the standard deviation of the sample over the square root of n, right? That's the standard error of the mean, and calculus gives us that. Right, so we, we see the, actually where that comes from for it. One thing I will note, if you have a function that's not closed form and you want to find the peak, what our packages do, what our software will do in R or in SPSS or whatever package you like to use, is they will start off with a guess. Right? They'll put you in, they'll say, oh, I'm going to guess the value of negative 1 here, and it will use more calculus, but uses a, a, a smarter search than just a grid. Uh, there's one method called newton raphson And newton raphson is a method where you're comparing values of the derivative and second derivative to figure out what a next guess should be. Until you keep moving closer and closer, moving around where the peak should be, and the value, you don't, you, your next guess is zero. You don't change at all. Right? So I liken it to this. If you, if we were to play the game here on campus, we can do this on our campus. We, we have a mountain on campus. Did you know that? Right? This is Mount Overyat. Isn't that right? Jake, I'm pointing to Jake. Jake's an undergrad. You've, been, you've had a master's here, right? I have a lot of degrees here. You have a lot of degrees here. That's Mount Overyat, right? Yeah. If we were to, like, blindfold you and, like, helicopter you into somewhere into Mount Overyat, and, you're, and every one of you would be on a different side, and the goal was to find the peak of Mount Oread, right? But you had to be blindfolded. Where would your first step be, right? That is kind of what the guessing process happens to be. Like right here, the first value is our like helicoptering you and putting you in one spot. You're blindfolded. Where'd your first guess be? Well, you kind of feel around, right? Like, wait a minute, which way is up? Which way is steeper? Right? And you take a step towards the steeper direction. And that's what this Newton Raphson thing does. And keep doing that until you get to the top and you step and everywhere is down from there or flat from there. Right? And that's the, where you stop. So maximum likelihood algorithms all work in that way. In fact, Newton Raphson is mostly used, or something version version of it. It's mostly used in that way where it's essentially trying to figure out the direction of steepest ascent. Right? It starts off with initial guess and it tries to pick values that get you closer to the summit or the peak. Do we have a summit of Mount Oria? <laughs> Would that be, uh, don't say it, Fraser Hall? Ugh. How many of you work in Fraser? Nobody does. Can we put it down? That building needs to be condemned, right? It is a terrible building. Sorry, maybe not. I know you have clinical childhood. Do you guys go to Fraser very often? No. Okay. You hate it too? Yeah. That building is terrible. I used to work there. Anyway. Okay. So, uh, to estimate, I just said that on recording. I didn't single out anybody who else worked there. <laughs> but I'm going to look for support to say, I, I've put petition threats, just tear it down, like put up a different version of it. But 
to estimate our models, the estimation of ML, uh, GLMs, I'm going to show you a little bit of how to do this in R. Um, there are other packages out there that do it. SAS has a package called proc mixed. If you use Stata, there's an XT mixed. If you use SPSS, it's a mixed function. <laughs> you get the sense, right? Something's mixed. Why it's called mixed, we'll learn later on, right? That it's mixed. Um, these packages will grow in value to you as time goes on. That's a bold statement. You're really going to come to like these. It sounds like an arranged marriage, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, after a while, you'll be okay. Get past that first 30 years and that, not a big deal. Uh, but generally speaking, how many of you think you might have to use multi-level models? There's a few. That's good. How about um, repeated measures analyses? All right. Multivariate ANOVA. Yeah, there we go. Uh, factor analysis. Structural equation models. Yeah, they're all part of this, right? They all can be done in this context. So they all use ML. Uh, the mixed part of it stands for um, linear mixed effects, essentially. Basically, it's saying uh, we have effects that are fixed, and I mentioned that before about those predictors, those betas are called fixed effects. There are other terms of those that are called random. We don't get into that fully in this class. We sort of hinted it by the end of class, and then you go off into multi-level, and that's all random effects. Or you go off into structural equation modeling, and that's all random effects. But we're doing the fixed effects side of things here. Uh, but the mixed models work for both of us. The nice thing, actually, I should say, is the mixed models solution, the things that we're going to do here, in if your model, if your data are continuous, if you'd run a regression or an ANOVA on it, the result you'll get from mixed and the result you'll get from your ANOVA regression, the betas will be the same. Because in the very one case, in, in very in one limited case that runs the world, <coughs> when you have data that you call continuous and error follows a normal distribution, the fixed effects for maximum likelihood and the fixed effects for least squares turn out to be the same thing. So you've been doing maximum likelihood all the time, although we don't really say that. So why I'm mentioning this to you here is that some of the other benefits of maximum likelihood, the model comparison, the likelihood ratio test, the, the, the parameter comparison, and so forth, will come out, and that will be different. Even though the parameters look the same, how you compare them won't be on sums of squares tables, won't be on, uh, there'll be F tests, but there won't be a table, and it won't be obvious where F comes from. Not that it was obvious before, but at least there was a formula somewhere. So, there we go, that's Newton Raphson. Newton Raphson. We can do, I'm using a function called GLS in the nonlinear mixed effects package. Uh, it looks very much like the LM function that we learned about last week that you're likely using in homework this week. This NLME function uh, works so much the same that if you were to go and want to do hypothesis tests, if you were to actually use this function for your analyses in homework, uh, so long as you put RE in front of ML, it would give you the same numbers. And you would even use GLHT the same. Like all of it seems to be very similar in R, which is a nice thing. You don't have to completely learn something new. It's just a little bit different, although the syntax is a monster to kind of get to know. So the first model is going to be this empty model that we just did before. Right? We, we plugged and chug. We chug, plug and chug. I sound like a math teacher. We plugged in a bunch of those mean values, a bunch of those variance values, and figured out the, the height. This is going to do it a little bit more, uh, as we say in statistics, elegantly. Right? It's going to use newton raphson and it's going to figure out the peak. Have you ever heard that before, the word elegant used with statistics? I kid you not. That is a part of the, oh, that's an elegant model. That's an elegant method for doing that. Right? Have you ever heard that? Not, not another word you probably wouldn't associate with statistics, right? Okay. So we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to start with the GLS. We're going to start with an empty model, and then we'll add in uh, prediction of IQ with job performance itself. Uh, pardon me. IQ is the dependent row. Oh, yes. And then we're going to flip it around. Uh, so NL, M, NLME, the syntax for it is right here. Uh, we use something called GLS. The dependent variable shows up to the left of a tilde. The, put, the placing of a 1 after it means just estimate the intercept. That's all. Nothing else. 
which is really kind of stupid. If you're looking up other syntax out there, not a lot of people estimate empty models, but I like them. They're a good place to start for our data. And here, if we put method equals ML, that's an option in the program. We call it an argument to a function. That makes it so that this GLS function does what we just did in this class with ML. Its default is the unbiased version, residual maximum likelihood. But we're not, not there yet in instructions. So I'm going to teach you ML first, OK? So we put this in to this statement. It returns a bunch of numbers into this model 01 object. And to get the numbers out, we ask it with a summary statement. And it tells us here, generalized least squares fit by maximum likelihood, model IQ tilde 1. And here it gives us some coefficients, AIC, BIC. Hey, wait a minute, log likelihood. That's a good one. We saw that one before. And you'll note the log likelihood that it gave us was the log likelihood that ended up from the grid search where I found mu and sigma squared. The estimated value of, of, of the estimate, this is the beta zero, or in an empty model, the mean of IQ is 114.4, which we found as well. Okay, so it's doing the same thing with our data. The standard error of that, 1.029, comes from that formula you saw before, although it's using a little more complicated version of it. It still arrives at the same result. And then you have this T value that says, if I took this parameter divided by standard error, this thing should follow a T distribution. As N goes to infinity, it becomes Z. We actually call this thing the Wald test statistic. We're going to hear about that in just a second. We've seen this before. You did this in regression before. So, boy, that's really tiny font. These are all the names in the object. One of the things that we also like that you'll find very helpful when you um, do analyses like multi-level or repeated measures ANOVA or multivariate and open and so forth, is to ask what your sample size is, how many variables you have per person, whether or not you use Reynolds. That's the DIMS statement. I always like to start there. The other thing uh, you'll note, sometimes you'll put a model in, and it won't give you all this. It'll give you a message that says model did not converge. What that means is if we go back to what I was talking about with newton raphson it's taking incremental steps to try to find the peak, right? It's trying to move up. At some point, one of the options in the computer is to stop taking steps. If you've taken 500 steps, each, each package has its own number, right? If you haven't found the maximum by a certain number of steps, it kicks you out. So that may happen. So you'll find a note that says warning, or it won't even give you results. It'll just say no, no convergence. That means you'll have to go back and add more steps to the analysis. We call the steps iterations. If you do use those results, and I kid you not, my first job here, just out of grad school, fresh and ideal with the ideas of maximum likelihood tucked in my brain. I come to campus and one of my colleagues says, sometimes I use results that didn't converge because they just make more sense. All right? I kid you not, I heard this from a person who was Thought, I, I thought at the time to be well respected in, in my field. Um, don't use those. All those awesome things we talked about with MLE don't apply. That's like using Bob's dad's estimates. Right? You've got to make it converge before you can make it work, before you can interpret it. I know Jake's smiling. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess? I'll cut it down. Todd Little. I said it. I said it loud. Yeah. He's off teaching stats camps now and telling everybody to use don't, don't use MLEs because they don't make sense. Anyway, maybe he's changed his tune by now. I don't know. Okay. So in the output, you'll see the residual standard error is 2.059. That is the square root of that 4.24 number that we had uh, to give us the variance. Or actually, it's the square root. Yeah, 4.24. Also in the output, you see a lot of likelihood, and then there's these things called AIC and BIC. AIC stands for AKIK, Information Criterion. BIC stands for Bayesian Information Criterion, which was created by Schwartz, so he didn't want it to be sick, I guess. Sorry, bad joke. All right. Um, these 
are for model comparisons. Right? If I run this analysis and Megan runs this analysis, first of all, Megan's probably going to be right. But we can compare which model worked better if we had different variables or different terms in it by looking at our AIC. The smallest AIC is the preferred model. Uh, now you'll say, but there's a BIC. Well, we could have picked BIC and done the same process, right? So if you have model A and model B and model C and model D or whatever, you've got like four models you've run because you can't quite figure out which one's best. AIC <coughs> may pick one, and it's going to be one lowest AIC. BIC may pick a different one. Which one do you pick? Probably the one the reviewers <laughs> to. Sorry, there's no good comparison. These are a messy set of statistics, but they do come about from maximum likelihood. What they try to do is take the fit of the model as index, or how well your model fit happens to be as indexed by this log likelihood, and penalize it by the number of parameters in your model, or, or sort of how complex your model happens to be. So if you add, if you get a model, and the easiest way to make a model fit better is to add more parameters. Add more things to it, right? Just keep adding stuff, it'll fit better. Well, that might not be as parsimonious as you want. So these are supposed to index parsimony. Um, we won't use these a whole lot in this class. They're, much, they're useful when you have models that don't overlap that you're using. We call them non-nested models. For nested models, we have a much more awesome statistic. And finally, here's the fixed effects. Also, so here's our fixed effect value. You saw this before, our coefficients. If we ask for the ANOVA table from this, uh, this is a big departure from what you see if you do this with the LM function. The LM function runs on least squares. It gives you a full table. For this, it just tells us intercept, gives us numerator degrees of freedom, F value, and a P value. It doesn't have sums of squares for between, or sums of squares model, sums of squares total. It's just that. And that's because there are no sums of squares in this approach. Right? Sums of squares came about because that squared error term that you talked about, that was what we were trying to minimize. So you end up getting those in the minimization process. We're not minimizing that here. So we get an F table. It's not quite the same. The F statistic comes from really awesome stuff. You saw that last year, Megan and Jake. Who else saw that? Haisha. Also in my class. But it takes a lot of matrices to get there. It's pretty ugly. Okay, so let's talk about some of these useful properties real quick. Actually, let me stop. Questions. Do I have any more converts? Any more person? Carolina, are you still buying what I'm selling? That's good. Anybody else? Nobody? Oh, that's tough. All right. Let's talk a little bit about these um, useful properties. Um, what we can do is... Uh, we can look at, we're going to look at likelihood ratio test, wall test, and information criteria. Um, now, this is where it gets weird. I had used my example with IQ up to this point, so we just did an empty model on IQ. But if this was a job performance thing, if you, had a, if you were an employer and you're trying to hire people and IQ was important for your job, uh, the, uh, you wouldn't predict IQ, you wouldn't want to predict IQ with performance, it'd be the other way around. You'd have, a, you'd have people you've employed you have a rating of their job performance and you want to predict how well they did based on their IQ. So we're going to make IQ now an independent variable. All right? A little bit weird. Sorry for the, the lapse in the story, but it seemed to fit better if I predict performance. All right, so we're going to estimate two models now, right? And these will both be used to demonstrate how the estimation here will differ from our least squares estimate that we've seen up to this point. The first model we're going to estimate is an empty model, so this should give us an intercept, which would be the mean job performance, and a residual variance that would be the variance of that job performance. And then we're going to put a model together where we add mean-centered IQ to the analysis, right? The IQ and subtract off 114.4. Right? So what we're going to see with this is we're going to be able to tell, because these models are nested in that if we were to take beta 1 and set it equal to 0, this more complicated model would all of a sudden become the simple model, the intercept model. Right? That, is, that is a situation where we would call these two models nested. We can use this likelihood ratio test to compare which model fits the best. 
We could also use a walled test to tell, test whether or not each parameter was statistically different, significantly different from zero, although you've sort of been using those all along in regression if you look at the, the coefficients table. And we can also take a look at information criteria. Okay? All right, so here's the first model. Per performance, perf. Perf tilde one, that's an empty model. We get a summary statement from it. Uh, and then if we mean center IQ, we get perf tilde IQ 114. So I created a variable named uh, in R syntax, whoops. That's not what I want. That's not what I want. What am I doing wrong here? There we go. Okay. Here's our syntax for you, right? This this first line, I did this for you in homework when that starter syntax, and I'm just going to keep talking about it. We're creating a brand new data variable in the data set data01. So it's data01 dollar sign IQ114, and that's just going to be equal to a person's IQ that's in data01, uh, where we take 114.4 and subtract it. That's our new variable. So now, when we put in the variable into GLS, performance will be tilde IQ114. You'll note the one went away. I had a, in the empty model above, it was I, I, uh, perf tilde one, and now it's perf tilde 114, IQ114. You could put a one there and put plus, it would work the same. It's just this one is the notation in R for an intercept. Oh boy. Templin, Templin, Templin. Let's do this. And this one. Bless you. And this right here. Okay. Now it's close enough. So, questions in comparing between these two models. How do we test the null hypothesis that IQ predicts performance? And we can do that with two methods, likelihood ratio and wall test. It's actually a third method. It's kind of voodoo, actually it's kind of awesome. <laughs> There's a way using maximum likelihood where we can take this model that we didn't even have IQ in and test whether or not IQ should be added to it. That's called a score test. Oh, we don't talk about that too much in this class. Isn't that cool? You can fit a model that didn't even have the variable and be like, should I add it? Kind of awesome. Um, the likelihood ratio test, uh, this is a nice test when you have more than one parameter. It's a fairly straightforward place. It involves those likelihoods that we saw before. Fit a model, get a likelihood statistic, or a log likelihood. Fit another model, get a different log likelihood. A combination of those will give you a test statistic. Walled tests are typically done for one parameter. And then finally, if IQ does significantly predict performance, what percentage of variance in performance does it account for? So that would be like a R squared itself. So here, the likelihood ratio test is the first. Uh, the likelihood ratio test uh, takes that likelihood, or in our case, the log likelihood, from the MLE. Remember, that was the peak, right? So you have, we have two models here. We have two peaks of functions. And the peaks themselves may be at different heights. Right? So taking those two numbers, the way we do this, if we're using the log likelihood, the likelihood ratio test, to do this, we come up with what's called a test statistic, like we do in every other statistical hypothesis test. And the likelihood ratio <coughs> test is negative two times the difference in log likelihoods. Right? Negative two is a weird number. Um, I don't want to go into that, it's a little complicated. But once you get this, once you get this, what's that? No, don't want to go into that. I'm just not going to talk about that. No comment. Uh, once you get this, uh, this number, you can compare it with a chi-square distribution. Right? The chi-square distribution, the degrees of freedom of this chi-square distribution are the number of parameters that are different in the two models. Right? So let's think this through before we go to the next slide, where it's done for us. Um, we have model one. How many parameters are in this empty model? We have a beta zero here. That's one of them. That's, how, that's one estimated value. Right? The next value, we do, you can't even see it on here, but it's the, the residual variance. 
Right, so parameters are telling us how many dimensions are we searching over in this MLE thing, right? There's a beta zero dimension and there's a sigma squared error dimension. In the second model, how many parameters do we have? One. Now we have beta one, that's two. And we have sigma squared error, that's three. There's three dimensions. So model one, or this is what we're calling model two in my code, the empty model has two parameters. The model with IQ in it has three. The difference in parameters will be one. So this is going to be our, log, our likelihood ratio test will be compared to a chi-square with one degree of freedom. So here we do. So in this analysis, if we're thinking about it, we have two models. right? We had the empty model, and we had the model with IQ in it. And the way we got from the more complicated model to the simpler model is by setting one or more parameters equal to zero that thing that we had to set to zero is going to become our null hypothesis. Right? And this hypothesis is a likelihood ratio test is going to test the hypothesis that the things that you had to set to zero or set to constants would have to be in place to achieve the simpler model. So there's always in a likelihood ratio test two models. There's a null model and there's an alternative model. The null model really comes from the null hypothesis, right? Take the alternative model and enforce the null hypothesis. Our alternative model had beta 1 in it. If we make the null hypothesis true, beta 1 goes away, and that's our null model. Right. So we have the null model. There's one intercept, one residual variance. We have our alternative model, one intercept, one slope, one residual variance. So the difference in parameters is 1, 3 minus 2. And there's one degree of freedom. So here, here's our log likelihood from our null model, negative 10.65858.65848. And our log likelihood from our alternative model was negative 3.46. So if we took the difference of those, multiply them by negative 2, we see we get a value of 14.4. Furthermore, we could go and compare that. This is the chi-square value that comes from it the degree of freedom one. Don't have to memorize this because I'm going to show you real quick on another slide that R will do this for us automatically. <laughs> so this is the hand calculation behind it. 14.4 gives us a p-value of 0. 0.00001. So we would go, just like in all of our hypothesis tests, with a p-value that small, we would reject the null hypothesis. And by implication, we would reject that null model. Right? Because we're saying we need beta 1 to be not 0. So when we say that, we're back to the place where beta 1 is part of our model to describe it. So to me, the neat thing about this is it works for one parameter, or it will work for 500 all at once. Right? So here's the cool thing about R. If you're doing that process in SPSS or SAS, you have to do that all that I did before by hand, and you have to figure out the function that gives you the chi-square tail. Or you can write a macro or take my wife's class and she has a micro or she wrote it for you and everything's good, right? In R, if you put both models into the ANOVA function, remember ANOVA gave us the ANOVA table before? Now look at how it works. It goes and gives you both models, gives you how many degrees of freedom, that's the number of parameters in each, right? Shows you their summary statistics and then provides at the end here a column that says test. Model 1, so this is our empty model, versus model 2, there's our likelihood ratio. That's its p value. R just sold me. One line of code. It's nice. So you can run multiple models. And when we get into multivariate statistics, you're going to run a lot of models. There's a model building process that you have to go through. So you're going to be putting models together, doing this type of process, and you'll have a table that will show you the model comparisons as you go along. So the ANOVA function is awesome. Yeah, Benjamin. So back, sorry, what does it tell you that model 1 or model 2 or model 3 is better? Like, where is the number that you would indicate which model to go with? Oh, okay, so once again, this is this, mo this likelihood ratio test is testing model 1 versus model 2. So if this p-value is small, you're going to reject the null model or the model with fewer degrees of freedom. So it rejects model 1, right? And that comes from that idea that what we're do really doing is testing the hypothesis that put us into the null model in the first place, right? To go from alternative to null, we had to go and make beta 1, 0. 
So that means it has fewer terms in it. Does that help? So in, you might say to me, but Templin, regression in ANOVA, I know how to do this. It was a, what do they call, what Cal call it? Sum of squares change test. Remember that? If you had two ANOVA, two regression models, you could look at the sums of square, the diff, sum of squares differences and come up with a similar test. This is replacing it. This is our likelihood ratio test. And this is a test that's called a, te a uniformly most powerful test. How you like that, Jennifer? That same, that same minimum variance thing for, tells you that for this comparison of models, there's no other test statistic that you can do that will give you a more e an easier way of determining whether or not there's a significant difference. Things beep, and I'm like, okay, what's what's what is it? It's not me. How are we doing? Questions on on likelihood ratio. So likelihood ratio helps in model comparison of nested models, right? They're nested because how you form your null hypothesis is sort of the directions you have to take to get from all the parameters down to the simpler model, right? The null model itself. That is me. Oh, man. Sorry. My kid's calling. I've been in the graduate class, did I tell you this story? I think I did, where the professor answered his phone, it was his kid, and then he proceeded to, an to order his kid pizza. He <laughs> called, like it was like a three-way call, and then he was like, yeah, hey, Papa John's is on the line, can you give me your credit card? And so he pulls out his credit card. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, no, you need, you need to focus. No, just kidding. <laughs> There's no eating in our classrooms, or drinking. Right? <laughs> so, um, so that's 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 testing the models themselves. If you have nested models, likelihood ratio test is the most powerful way to test them to detect differences in models. Right? So it will tell you one model is preferred to another. To do a likelihood ratio test, you have to have two models, though, right? So it's, it can be time consuming, can be complicated. Another option in maximum likelihood is the Wald's test statistic. The Wald statistic relies on the, the normality of the result. And the way it works is we take a parameter that comes from the MLE, and if we're testing that parameter to be significantly different from some constant, usually this is zero. Right? We take the parameter minus the constant. In this case, if it's zero, it's just the parameter and divide it by its standard error that comes from the maximum likelihood process. The parameter divided by standard error gives us a test statistic that should follow a normal distribution, standard normal. So as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and goes to infinity, we can compare the parameter over the standard error with a z-table. And that gives us what's called a Wald test. Now, you'll, if you look back into our output, for the parameters, going back way back here, you know, like 10 minutes ago, um, here's parameter and standard error. It says T value there. That, that, that's the Wald test, but it's not assuming that, you've, that, that you knew the variance itself, so it's like a finite sample version of it. So it, it uses a slightly different distribution, but again, as N goes to infinity, it becomes normal, and the P value comes from it. But this T this line right here is your Wald statistic. It comes from maximum likelihood. And it's testing whether or not the parameter is equal to zero. So this empty model is testing whether the mean is zero. It's kind of a silly test. But we could use the Wald test in our more complicated model if we fit the alternative model, right? And we wanted to test whether or not the slope for IQ was equal to zero. We we saw we did this with likelihood ratio, but we could do it with one model if we plug that in and take a look at the p-value here, right? Here's our slope for IQ. It's 9.9622, whatever. Slope divided by standard error is your Wald test statistic for it. We're going to compare it with a t-distribution here. So it's, again, we call that finite sample. And p-value is 0 0.0058. That p-value is very small. So we would reject the null hypothesis and we'd conclude we need IQ in this model. But there's a, <coughs> a significant increase in job performance for every increase in IQ. 
So wall tests, generally speaking, come from that coefficient of parameter estimates. So we often just use them with one parameter. There are multiple parameter versions of them. Uh, depending on how fancy we get in this class, we may see some. But the nice thing about walled is you only have to run one model to make it work. Right? We're testing the same hypothesis, but with one model. So one thing you might be asking is, which one do I believe better, the likelihood ratio or walled? And in the limit, again, if n was infinity, they would converge to the same result. You would pick the same thing, whether you use walled or likelihood ratio. OK. The final thing is, yes, we know we need beta 1. This is not an ML thing, but we're just going to play with numbers here. If we were to compare our estimate of residual variance, we'd see that uh, the residual variance from our empty model is 4.16. From the conditional model is 0.234. So if we take the difference between these and divide it by the original value, we see that we explain 94.4% of the variance. Those numbers are off. I think I put the wrong number in. Anyway, R will do this. Uh, we could do this in R as well. All right. Finally, um, information criteria show up. Uh, remember, I told you before, you could use these to compare model fit. Now, they're not as powerful as likelihood ratio if you have nested models like we have here. Right? But let's pretend these weren't nested. To figure out which model we want, we'd have to look at one of these and figure out the lowest value. So here for AIC, it picks model the second model. And for BIC, it actually picks the second model as well. So if, if we used AIC, we'd pick model, the second model. If we pick BIC, we'd pick the second model. They're nice, they're converged, and so forth. Um, don't use information criteria in nested model comparisons. They're not as powerful. But other than that, you'll see them from time to time. Places where you'll see those, ever heard of mixture models before? Like latent class analysis? heard of those. We were trying to figure out whether or not you have multiple groups of people in your data that you didn't collect group variables on. If you've heard of that. Uh, you see a lot of them used to figure out which solution is best. I don't even know that they're good in that case, but it does happen. So uh, here's how ML and least squares estimation for these linear models differ. Um, you'll note that the the values are um, ML and least squares are identical for these models. They differ in their estimate of the residual variance itself, right? And that's that idea in that you know from from least squares, least squares. If we did the LM function, we'd see the residual variance was 0 0.390, and from ML, the residual variance was 0.234. So the ML version was smaller. And that's that biased estimate that we end up dealing with there. Right. ML, for linear models, ML, maximum likelihood, straight maximum likelihood, is biased. Uh, if you're troubled by this, in a few weeks we will find this new method, new ER method, REML. If you really like it, REML. Depends on if you're Ryan or not. Right? Um, it will, uh, it will give you unbiased estimates, and they'll be identical. So one of the nice things, why I'm talking about this, why this matters here, when you have one outcome, it doesn't really make a difference. So when you learned ANOVA regression, you learned least squares because it would give you an answer always. It didn't really change much. When you get to multivariate statistics, though, that's where the difference starts to play. Least square starts to go away for most of the models that are out there. Right? There are still some very key terms to it, where we use least squares or where we see least squares. The classical version of um, multivariate ano ANOVA and the classical version of repeated measures. But what we're going to see in this class is that there's a big difference between repeated measures and multivariate ANOVA. And usually the truth is somewhere in between. And if all you knew was least squares, you wouldn't get to the truth. You'd get, you'd get kind of too simple or too complex. So we're going to use ML for that. That's where it's showing up. If you're like, they're the same, why do I care? Beyond that, when you get into structural equation models, when you get into path analyses, uh, ML is the only thing that's out there um, that you should trust, I should say. So, questions? 
Ta-da. Now, how many more of you are sold? Uh, I got a smile. Michael, maybe? No? Thinking about it. Thinking about it, huh? Let me go home and think on it. You're going to think about it a little bit? Well, I'm going to have to uh, tell you that whether or not you're sold, we're going to, this class is a, uh, it's interesting, if I could give you a little history, here we go, I know you want to go home, we're going to go home quick, I promise. The multivariate books that use least squares were sort of built, were, were sort of in a tradition that started long before computers happened. Maximum likelihood's been around since the 1920s, and we got really good at it in the 1930s and 40s, but it's all theory, but to do that, to do the calculations we need, we really need a computer to work. So the least squares was a shortcut to maximum likelihood that was attainable for most people doing science and research and so forth before computers became widely available. The thing I look at for multivariate texts now is most of them are still based on least squares methodology. Things like canonical correlation, uh, propensible components analysis for exploratory factor analysis, uh, MANOVA, repeated measures of ANOVA, and so forth are all least squares based. And if you have perfect data and perfect assumptions and so forth, they'll work fine. The problem is maximum likelihood will come along and match them in the cases where you have perfect data, but when you have imperfect data, you'll get better results from it. So why this happens, why I'm teaching the course this way, is that maximum likelihood really is the modern way of doing statistics and has been since the 1960s. And yet when we teach multivariate, if you go look at those textbooks, I'm telling you, go, go pull out Tabachnik and Fidel or come to my office, I've got a whole host of them you'll see that none of them have maximum likelihood based statistics. So I want you I want this to be different. This is this is my pitch to you. So even if you're not buying it yet, hang in there. Maybe by the end of class. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> maximum likelihood will show up everywhere. Um, we are going to um, we're going to see that maximum likelihood will really help when we have start having violations of assumptions of GLNs. So that's the other thing about uh, least squares, is when things didn't fit the model, you had to go and shove them into it. Like you normalize your data or create non-parametric statistics or who knows what, right? In ML, we can just change the likelihood function a little bit and still do ML, right? So if you had non-independence of observations, well, we switch from a univariate normal to a multivariate normal, where we have covariances involved in it. Hey, now we don't have to worry about that. We still do ML. Uh, if you had, in, in least squares and an open regression, we assumed everybody had the same error variance, or it was homoscedastic. Uh, if it was heteroscedastic, I keep pointing her, she, tweet, she was the only one that tweeted uh, heteroscedastic, um, then we could actually go and plug that in our likelihood, because it's just another term. We could, we could go and predict the variance, right? We can go and go and give beta weights for variances now because they're just more dimensions to optimize over. So ML gets more flexibility for it. And if we didn't have normality of variables or normality of er errors, we switch the distribution out. All right, it's not continuous, probably not normal. Fine, make the distribution the one you want. Still use ML. So ML is much more broad than all those least squares things that we learned. So that's it. Go home. Have a good night. Or ask me questions. So. Thank you.